screams in the night. Indian legends. Miles of footprints. Sightings. What are these elusive hominids that stalk the wilderness? Join us for eyewitness accounts, questions and answers, Bigfoot encounters of the past, and ongoing encounters in the present. Your host, two-time witness, field researcher for 43 years, William Jevning. Welcome to the mystery. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Creek Devil. Uh, we have Tom with us this evening. Tom, Brian, how you doing, fellas? Good. Very good, Bill. I want to mention Sorry. something real quick before we start. Um, our good friend T.W., our, our cop buddy in the Southwest, um, has some products, some knives that he makes. And they're pretty nice. If you go on uh, the JRG Bigfoot Research Group page on Facebook, you can take a look at what he's got there. Uh, they're pretty nice. So uh, check those out. Uh, I don't. I got to ask him if he has a you know any kind of a page for a direct link or anything. But they're on. He has them posted there. And uh, if anybody's interested in buying those, you can contact contact him directly on the page. So, uh, well, let's fellas, let's get started with the first segment of the show. Tom, uh, we actually do three different segments of the show. So uh, you're in the hot seat on the first segment. So. Uh, tell us what's uh, going on. Okay. Um, so I think maybe it might make sense to uh, just sort of back up a little bit and tell everybody that I was actually on your show about a year ago, last May, in regards to my an encounter that I had um, here in Oregon. Um, I was up, a friend of mine and I had gone up to get a Christmas tree kind of up in the uh, Cascades and on the way down, um, just got below the snow line and had to re take the chains off my truck. And, and uh, it was in an area that was, at this time, it was just pitch black. It was pretty dark, and it was absolute silence in the forest. So, you know, got under there, took the chains off. And in the process of doing that, I'm a little bit of a character, so I grabbed a piece of wood and I went over and I knocked on a tree. And by the way, Will, I have since found out that I think wood knocking is just sort of a kind of a modern phenomenon. It's not really necessarily associated with these things. But Correct. Correct. Yes. <laughs> okay. But I didn't know then. And I knocked and I and um, went back to, you know, what I was doing, putting the chains away. And bear in mind, just to kind of a, paint a sort of a word picture of what the area was like. We were miles and miles into the wilderness. And uh, uh, just, I mean, there's nobody around. There's one road in, one road out, and we hadn't seen anybody. And it's one of those overgrown you know, forest service roads, not even paved. It's just a very rough road. And um, probably about two, three minutes after I did that tree knock, I was still in the chains, and we heard... For all intents and purposes, it was like somebody, you know, when they put their fingers to their mouth and make a, you know, loud whistle, a very sharp whistle, and probably 15, 20 yards from the truck. And I heard it, and I, I was so tired, I didn't pay any attention. My, my buddy's like, what was that? And phrased it a little differently, maybe. <laughs> um, so that was... That got me thinking, and actually, really, I thought about it quite a bit, and that's why I initially contacted you. I just, like, it really boils down to two things. Either somebody was standing in the woods that didn't have a car, and they were 40 miles from anywhere, or it was a Sasquatch. And based on a lot of other evidence and what I confirmed later, um, I talked with somebody who is – a public official who is uh, responsible for that part of the, the wilderness. And this person said that, uh, yeah, there's lots of them up there. So um, that's kind of where that went. And um, so fast forward a little bit. I um, <clears throat> So this is something that I've thought about quite a bit. And... It's it kind of dominates your thoughts from time to time. 
So I actually had shared this with a family member, with my aunt, and I really wrestled for actually weeks and months whether I'd tell her, but I finally felt that maybe I could trust her. And, um, and this is a little bit of a shout out to people listening to maybe have the courage to, if you feel like you're, you know, if you can do it, share your experiences with people around you. Um, you might be surprised. So as soon as I told her, she got very quiet and said, well, you need to talk to your uncle. And by the way, you need to talk to your cousin. Now, why is that? Well, they both had separate encounters. So uh, with that said, I'll just kind of move into the one that I think um, they're both interesting. But my uncle, he's 81. And he grew up in California, Northern California. His his father was, uh, he'd worked for the Forest Service, and um, back in the 50s, and possibly the early 60s, they, um, they were working in an area called Happy Camp, which I think is kind of like sort of ground zero for a lot of the uh, Sasquatch sightings. So he was, uh, <clears throat> he worked for the Forest Service, and he was in charge of a, a road grader. And they were in an area, and I took some notes, so he thought it was either um, Scott Bar, California, or um, another area called Gritter Creek. He wasn't really sure, but it's up north, uh, northern California. <clears throat> and basically what they did is the, the road grader would go along, and then at nighttime they had a spare tire that they kept in the back of one of the trucks. And rather than haul it all the way back down again, they just would take this tire that weighs hundreds of pounds and lean it up against the back of the road grader. And they came up the next morning, tire was gone. And there's nowhere, you know, they're, they're making the roads. <laughs> there's no other access roads in this area. So they'll look around and finally down a canyon on the opposite side of a creek, they found the tire. They could see it. And it's not just a tire, but it's a tire with the, you know, the metal wheel, the hub inside. So this thing weighs, you know, a few hundred pounds. And I asked him, I, 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 Dave is his name, I said, did your dad have an idea how it got down there? He said, yeah, he knew exactly how it got down there. He said this thing was thrown. And the distance... Um, down this ravine or old canyon or whatever. He said it's about 75 yards, but it's on the opposite side of a creek, and there's no access to the other side of the creek or on the other side of this ravine or small canyon. And there's no evidence whatsoever that it had been rolled down. And even if it had been rolled, it couldn't have crossed the creek. So they had to call in a wrecker and then basically take a cable down there and attach it to the wheel and haul it back. But one of the guys, one of the crew members is what you call a, um, a swamper. He's the guy that runs behind the grader and picks up the rocks that are, that the grader leaves behind and he just throws them in a ditch. You know, they're trying to make a nice level road. And um, so this guy was, uh, along with a lot of the crew members, was Native American. He's an American Indian that lived up in the area, worked for the Forest Service. And he, uh, my uncle said, this guy's there's nothing doing. He is, has no interest whatsoever in going down and hooking up the cable to haul this thing back. And when he left that day, that was it. He said he would never be going back up to that area again. And so th I thought that was interesting because, you know, this is in the 50s. This is, uh, you know, Patterson Gimlin film didn't come out till '67, so it's like, how did these guys know? Well, they apparently they had their own culture and their own history uh, and understanding of what these things were. So um, I just found that to be, a, you know, pretty interesting story. And you know, a side note to that one too, uh, throwing something heavy and large like that. Um, 
before, of course, you know, the film was made in Bluff Creek, and, and Happy Camp's not that far from Bluff Creek, really. Um, there was an incident with some filled oil or diesel drums that were thrown around, and I actually met one of the loggers who was part of that crew and saw that. So there, there was a... Apparently they had a dislike for uh, man-made objects and occasionally would toss them around. You know, it's funny you mention that because I read that story. I don't know if it was in one of your books or somewhere I'd heard that some of these uh, 55-gallon diesel containers were hauled a long ways into the wilderness. Yeah. And I told Dave, my, my uncle, about that. And he found that pretty interesting. Uh, so you just confirmed. I, I was like, nah, I'm sure I've heard this. So now I, I know I've heard it. Um, but, you know, you think about it. So I went on to uh, some of the tire sites that sell, you know, um, dozer and great, greater tires. Um, and the weight of these things without a steel hub inside, on the low side, Tire alone is about 300 pounds for the small ones. And then the bigger ones, they run up 800 pounds. Yeah. But just, you know, be conservative. Let's say it's 300 pounds, and then you add, say, another 95, maybe 100 pounds for the uh, hub. And to throw that, and he said the ravine was at an angle. He said it was steep, but it wasn't a straight drop down. You couldn't just run up and throw it over like dropping it off the table or something. Um, it had something through it, not only down 75 yards, but out so that it would clear the, the ravine and the creek on the other side. That's yeah. a fair amount of strength it took to do that. <laughs> no human can do that. No. You know, I, I couldn't, you know, I would be hard pressed to throw it five inches. <laughs> <laughs> um... And he was very interested in the story. My aunt, uh, when she, you know, when we started talking back and forth about this, she asked him, she said, are these things real? He said, yeah, absolutely. They absolutely are. Um, a little history on, on, with his side of the family, I guess I can just go ahead and say this. Uh, his mom was a school teacher and, and I think a principal, she ran some of the schools up there, they started a uh, society called the uh, Siskiyou Historical Society. And apparently they, at one time, they had records of this incident, and it may have been reported in the local newspaper at the time as well. So it, it, was, it was a well-known thing. Um, so anyway, that was, that was my... Um, Uncle's story, and I just thought it was interesting that, you know, this happened yep. years, many, many years before Patterson Gimlin uh, came along. Yeah, absolutely, and then I know that uh, you said Sam had a story too, but uh, you you want to wait for her to come on, uh, like, a later time to tell it, or, or do you want to tell it, or... No, I can go ahead and relay her story. Um, sure. She said, go ahead and do it. She's um, uh, she had a migraine tonight, so she wasn't able to make it. Um, so when she, and she's oh gosh, I I, I want to say she's in her late thirties, early forties. But when she was a teenager in Idaho, um, she was seventeen. A group of them, a group of kids, uh, in the evening had gone for a drive uh, around some mountain. And honestly, I don't remember what it was. But they're going down the mountain, and they saw this thing standing on the side of the road. It had come up, and she said, this is the part that I thought was weird. It got down on, she said it wasn't quite on hands and knees. It was more like it was crawling not on its hands and knees, but crawling, and had crawled towards the car and had crawled up and got, you know, I think it positioned itself in the towards the back of the car and was, um, two people saw it. There was a bunch of kids in the car, and I think three of them did not see it, but two of them did, and 
the windows were down. She said we could smell it, and she described it. She said it was just this really nasty smell. And then it went up the mountain, but it didn't go on two legs. She said it, it uh, or it initially started crawling, and it might be a good good idea to get her on it because I'm sure she, you know, I might be botching this up a little bit. Well, we can have her on eventually, yeah. Okay. Um, but anyway, the driver of the car said, you know, the, what the heck is that? And they got out of there. So um, kind of an interesting story. And I don't know. I, I Will, do you have an opinion or a comment on this crawling around, not on hands and knees, but like, kind of like on their hands and feet or hands yeah. and legs? Yeah, you know, the, the first thing that came to mind was a lady I interviewed a while back. Um, she lives in Northern California now, but the incident that she described, and I think it was her and her daughter in the car, was actually New Mexico. And they saw one crossing the road in somewhat of a similar fashion. She said it was hard to describe because it was so bizarre. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they they will occasionally walk on all fours like that. Why they do it, I don't know, as opposed to bipedal walking. It, it's hard telling. Maybe it was, um, you know, a method of trying to sneak up on the car. Yeah, it's funny. That was the exact words that uh, Sam used. Was she said it looked so bizarre, and and I think that's what freaked. It wasn't just what this thing was, but the way it was walking was just creepy. You know, kind of freaked him out. And um, that was one of that was what she said. She said it was just so bizarre looking. Yeah, and, and Will, we actually talked about that a few weeks ago about how they might walk on all fours sometimes to stay low in order to, maybe they were hunting, you know. It's a, it's a kind of a lower way to stay out of sight for catching prey. It could be, and it could be a way of disguising itself, um, yeah. you know, around prey animals. I mean, here's the thing. I, I, don't, I don't know that deer necessarily, if, if they're within sight, now maybe a close proximity might run from a bear. Uh, but animals are scared to death of upright posture like ours. Uh, yeah. Now, whether they're afraid of us because of the things we do or they're afraid of us in that posture because of these things, you know, we might resemble that posture. Uh, it's hard telling. But uh, maybe being in a, a four-legged stance it could even be a, a form of camouflage in a way, you know, when, when stalking prey animals. In order, yeah. in order to get closer to him. Yeah, and I could just imagine what uh, what what Sam would be feeling at that point. Would just just seeing this thing kind of creep up like that. I mean, I would imagine it would be terrifying. Yeah, she said they were definitely freaked, and I think she was a little disappointed that it was only her and one other person in the car that saw this. And uh, her and I think she said the guy's name was Bruce saw it, and. Um, and then when it went up the hill, um, he goes, you know, what the hell is that? And they just, you know, they hit the gas and, and got out of there. Um, so, yeah, that would, uh, it, I didn't think about the um, getting on all fours as a form of camouflage. Um, but that's interesting. It's, yeah. it, it's an idea. I mean, it's, you know, it could be other things, but... Um... I, I don't know, my thinking in, in the context of the situation sort of makes me think that. Yeah, it was definitely sneaking up on the car. That was the impression she got and the other guy was that this thing was sneaking up on them. And uh, that's well, I'm sure that's probably what it was doing. Um, but I didn't think in terms of, you know, like deer and elk uh, being intimidated or getting a kind of a fear response seeing us humans walking on two legs so maybe when i go deer hunting i'll have to keep that in mind <laughs> you know I, I remember i remember an anthropology professor many years ago talking about that um you know that that's that standing up on hind legs is sort of an aggressive posture and we do it naturally so we take it for granted we don't think about the how it affects animals you know seeing us in that posture so um, so from that standpoint, sure, you get uh, that aggressive posture. If the animals are, 
you know, of course, they're intimately aware of these things. So since they walk like that, um, like I said, it could be, you know, whether the things we do shooting anim animals doing stuff like that uh, would cause that fear or animals associate that posture with these things so that when they see us, they get the same response as one or the other. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, and if, if you got time, I have one other story. <laughs> Absolutely. The microphone's yours. Yeah, I wish yours. we had these people with us. Um, you know, because it's, it's one thing for, for me to tell Sam's story. It's a whole other thing for her or my uncle or, or this other guy. You know, you, you pick up the emotion and the tone of voice in, you know, when they're relaying the story and it's that information gets lost in the translation, you know, when I'm telling it, but I'll do the best I can. <laughs> um, so it wasn't last summer. It wasn't too long after the interview with you that, um, I, you know, I just, I just kind of took a gamble and with certain people, you just kind of sense, maybe I could, you know, tell, tell my story with them. So I, I did that with the neighbor and he was, um, he was actually going to veterinary school and he was like, nah, I don't know about that. He goes, but <laughs> he goes, you need to talk to, and the guy across the street, he goes, you need to talk to him. So we had a block party and, and I mentioned it to this guy and he goes, yeah. And this kind of made me think about the gal that, um, uh, was elk hunting. You know, her dad was, uh, he had a disabled permit uh, in Southern Oregon. I don't know if you remember that story or not. But yeah, right, right. Okay, and you had sent off some pictures. Um, so this was in an area that was kind of east of Crater Lake area. And he was out, him and his buddies, I guess they were out elk hunting. And he had somebody in the cab of the truck and then he had some guys in the back of the truck and he said it was kind of the evening time and he's driving along and there's some i don't know if they're just stunted trees but you know you have that i think it's probably just some new growth like um what, what he was saying these are like seven foot conifers you know like oh, hemlock or whatever they are and he's driving along and this thing is standing two feet taller over the top of one of these and it's looking at him and what got him was the and this is something i wanted to ask you about he said it had a red eye shine to it like a, you know we've we've all seen you know raccoons and deer and stuff like that mm -hmm. have eye shine. he said this is like super bright the eyes followed him and they appeared to have a continued eye shine even after the headlights are gone and he said he saw this thing, and he's like, he didn't say a word. He just kept his mouth shut, kept driving, and the guy next to him was like, did you see that? And then the guys in the back of the truck, and the, in the bed of the truck, started pounding on the top of the truck, yelling, did you see that? So all of them were witnesses. They all saw it, and they're like, let's go back and check it out. He's like, well, let's not. Uh, <laughs> and... And they, they, they didn't, but um, the thing that got me was when he's telling the story was he wasn't trying to tell an interesting story, but rather he was very disturbed by it. Mm -hmm. It bothered him. And he was like, I don't know um, how I can do that. Um, and, and I read an article that somebody wrote. They thought that it's because of the design. But, yeah, I'm not a medical guy, but anyway the design of their eyes is such that it's extremely efficient at light gathering mm -hmm. and possibly more efficient at reflecting light. So I was just going to see if you, you know, if you had an opinion or a comment. Um, yeah. On you know, it's interesting. Uh, we had my old buddy Milo on with us uh, recently and um, we talked, you know, about the, the Clark ranch incident we experienced back in 1976 and of the four of us who were present, only Milo actually saw one of the creatures. Uh, they were around us most of the night, but only he actually saw one. And it was the firelight. He said the eyes were that red. You know, it was standing over the tent, looming over the tent, looking at him, glaring at him. Um, and, and he uh, had a little 
um, short word that he screamed, and <laughs> you know, we all turned around and it was gone, of course. But um, we've talked about eye shine before. A lot of times the coloration is due to the light source, the type of light source is, the type of bulb, things like that. Uh, we're going to have, for folks listening, we're going to have our anthropologist on next week uh, with one of our, our witnesses uh, who had taken photo, had a great uh, encounter and um, some of the best footprints I've ever seen. So anyway, we're going to talk to him a little bit about eye shine uh, in animals, especially primates. So uh, he can answer that question better than I could because, you know, he's got the credentials to and the knowledge for uh, the detailed information on eye shine, but um, red isn't isn't typically a common color, but it is a color that is reported. As far as the duration afterwards, I'm not sure about that. I I, I don't know how to answer that question to be honest. Yeah, it's funny. Um, my aunt was um, no, she was a nurse and she worked for an eye doctor for for years. Of, yeah, that's what she did. And she said only human eyes have a red reflection to them. Um, now, I'm not sure if that's true because, you know, it seems like I've driven down the road and you can see, like, you know, like raccoons, I think they have a red eye shine. But yeah. she did. And, again, it does. It depends on the light source. Right. That would make sense, yeah. Yeah. But I did hear that story. Uh, <laughs> it cracked me up that that was, I guess, Milo's first experience um, camping. <laughs> Yeah, he's, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's thinking you know this is what it's always like oh yeah those things are everywhere you know <laughs> you know I, I didn't remember at the time that that was his first experience camping I guess I didn't think about it or all of us didn't really think about it <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought that was great um, yeah. and it was based I didn't know that was your second book but I bought a few copies of it I the guy that he had the red eye shine um experience i gave him a copy and said dude you got to read this you need this so i gave him one and then i gave one to my brothers who was kind of on the edge about whether he's skeptical or not and i said not nah, just just read this and then you know which book was that in search of the unknown yeah the one that has the drawing the black and the right. Ink. right yeah yeah that is I mean, they're all good, but that to me is the best. Um, that was an awesome book. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. So I, I gave one to the guy next door so he could read it. And, and I don't know, that you might make some sense out of it. And um, another one to my brother. So. <laughs> well, and Tom, to just bring that back to what you said at the, at the beginning, too, about the importance of sharing experiences. Uh, now, in your case, you're talking about, you know, giving – books and so forth but i'm but just like share your experiences to anybody out there because you never know how many people that your neighbors your friends that might have stories themselves that just never told about it right so that's i think it's really really important for for that uh for those stories to come out and for people to share experiences and and uh share information yeah you know that's a very <clears throat> excuse me yeah that's a real good point um because I never would have heard these had I not just taken that step and said, okay, well, you know, I'm just going to yeah. take the plunge. And I also, uh, some guy plowed into my truck a while back, and when I went to the auto body shop, I just kind of mentioned it to the gals behind the counter, and she goes, oh, you got to talk to so-and-so. And then they were telling me about their experience uh, yeah. camping in the Coast Hills of Oregon, which I hadn't really thought of that as being a – place for Sasquatch but you know I suppose they could mm -hmm. and so yeah that yeah thanks Brian that that's um so just mentioning it you never know there's there's a percentage of people out there that yeah. may have a shared experience and and Will on that on that point um how many people have you talked to that maybe have had not had shared their stories had it not been for somebody else to tell them about their own stories oh lots i, I couldn't even put a number on it yeah because i'm sure it happens a lot where people think that they're the only ones and then all of a sudden they tell their they tell somebody not their, not all of, like their friends but maybe just tell a, a like a confidant 
And guess what? They might not have had an experience themselves, but they might have known somebody themselves who can also bring into light what they sh- what they experienced. Yeah, it's like Tom said. Uh, I, I started doing this back in the mid-'80s. Uh, a friend of mine and I used to go to the field together a lot. And in the usually the morning would start out when we'd go somewhere, we'd leave pretty early. And uh, we'd stop at whatever local restaurant had breakfast, and, and that kind of started the day off. And I, I thought to myself, well, I'm never going to find out if I don't just approach people and ask them. So I made a habit of, you know, getting up, going over, picking a random table, and asking the people there, you know, told them who I was, what I was doing, and asked them if they had ever seen one of these creatures. And I n- was never laughed at, ever. Uh, people were interested. Now, it, well, occasionally you get somebody to say, well, you know, I, I don't think they're real. But usually their companions would either, A, have a story that they had seen one, and, and to the surprise of their friends, or B, they would know somebody that had seen one. It was incredible the amount of information that came in that way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let me ask uh, Brian and, and Will, um, do you guys get the feeling that now it seems like there's uh, more and more people, percentage-wise, are comfortable talking about this? And it, it almost feels like there's uh, more of an acceptance, kind of a growing acceptance, sort of a grassroots acceptance of this thing. Yeah, it's it's on the rise. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and let me, let me add to that, too. Um, to, this will help <laughs> answer your question a little bit. Um, I've been teaching in college now for since 2006, so this is my 13th year. And at first, when I when I told even my professors or my um, my academic advisor, PhD, a couple PhDs, um, you know, I said, hey, you know, I'm kind of interested in the subject, and I just, you know, I helped Will write his or adapt his book and everything. And I thought that they were just kind of la- going to laugh it off. And they actually became really interested. They're like, wow, tell me more about this. So even in the academic world, I think that it's becoming more and more accepted. Um, and I have a lot of questions later on uh, tonight that we can get to, or maybe if it carries over till, till next week that, that I can ask Will about too. But I think that it's definitely becoming more and more accepted. Um, and even my family members, I mean, even, even people like my dad, who I didn't think would ever be... Um, saying oh i believe in that but then now he's really interested in in the subject and when you look at the evidence and you look at what will has done i think that more and more people are um, becoming more accepting to the to whatever's out there (laughs) if that makes sense (laughs) well that's kind of interesting that you're saying that the academics are or some of the academics are are becoming accepting or accepting this and and i'll tell you something that i personally get um I get approached more and more by professionals in different fields. Um, I I added on a a biologist here in the Bay Area recently. Um, And not just him, but he talks about it with his colleagues. And and they all seem to have an interest. I mean, it's not just dismissed like it used to be. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's... uh... And that's actually, I think, kind of encouraging. Um, and kind of, is it okay if I ask a, another question? Or? Yeah, go right ahead, Tom. Um, I think you had mentioned in one of your previous shows that back in the 50s, um, there was an estimated, and I don't know how they calculate this, fish and wildlife, but an estimated population or breeding population of about like 50,000 of these things. Well, it wasn't fish and game. Uh, that came from Mr. Black. Okay. The, the number, I think it was him. That one, one of those, one of the Mr. Blacks. There's, there's several of them actually. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> in, in the fifties on the continent, the estimated population was in around 50,000. Well, and, and I got to thinking when you, when you're talking about the geographical area of Alaska, Canada, and the United States, 50,000, if it was people, that was 50,000, that'd still be chump change. You know, if those people didn't want to be seen, you'd be forgiven if somebody came from another continent, came over here and said, yeah, no, nobody's there. I haven't seen anybody. Yeah, it would be very few and far between. 
Yeah. And and I think you mentioned that the number has <clears throat> significantly, it's gone up to uh, six digits now? Or? Right. Uh, in fact, even Grover Krantz, when they were speculating, and that's all it was of speculation, you, have to have, you do have to have a certain number uh, of uh, creatures in the species to have a viable breeding population. So I, I think that's kind of the figure. He was going at that time, I, I can't remember the time period it was, we're talking 70s or 80s. Um, he, his estimate was 10,000, which was significantly lower than um, what the people in the know knew. Yeah. Right, 10,000 across the entire, even if you, if you excluded Alaska and Canada, you know, that would that'd be a very, very, very sparse population. It would be, and they'd have to be relatively close to breed. Yeah, yeah, and and will on that note too. I mean, considering that these are probably the apex predators, uh, you could just look at the world population of people and how the world population has increased. I don't know how much. I don't know what the statistics are, but significantly oh, since yeah. the you know the fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, tens, and to today. Yeah, post World War Two, it really exploded. Yeah, yeah it, you'd, ha- you'd have to think by logic that these things would increase as well because it's not like, you know, you could say, you could look to uh, other species like the gorillas, which might be ex- or, uh, in, endangered species right now, but the fact that they're they're being hunted and things like that, that, that's different. I mean, these creatures that we're talking about are not being hunted necessarily. Well, and here's, so, here's the difference between animals like that and these creatures, uh, yeah. gorillas and chimps and so on. They, they live in very specific locations um, and, yeah. and they're, I'm trying to think of the terminology there. Let's just, for lack of better terminology, let's say they're not as, um, very, they're not as varied Oh, it's very, as a lot of other animals who are very, very successful and, and have large populations. Um, right. but they move around too. Right. And these creatures, um, you know, they're, they're not, um, I know when we have our anthropologist on, he'll he'll have all this terminology. I know what the terminology is. I just can't think of it at the moment. But um, you know that there's a lot of behavioral characteristics, feeding things like that. If you're very um, have a very narrow field of those things, right? If you're specialized. If you're spe- too specialized, uh, that leads towards extinction. Yeah. If, if you're a generalist, and, and that's what some of the, I think, Napier or some of those guys way back talked about the Sasquatch. The Sasquatch is a generalist. They're not specialized. So that lends them to... Move around. To, to, well, not just move around, but they, they can function in a lot of different ways. They can eat just about anything, which they do. Uh, they can go a lot of places that swim are, are away from us. They can swim. They can do... All of these yeah. things that really promote uh, the species being successful. Yeah, yeah. So they they can adapt to different situations and and feed circumstances. Exactly, exactly. They're they're, they're not like gorillas where only they only have certain types of foods in certain areas and things like that. Uh, they're very pragmatic, I yeah. would say. Animals that are too uh, too specific in in the things that they need. You know, when those things are removed, then, you know, their existence is threatened, whereas these things are, are the opposite of that. Right, right. You know, one of the things, getting back to the feeding, um, that I'm just curious about, and I don't think anybody's got an answer for it, but it's just an interesting thought, is have either one of you heard of this uh, condition that's affecting elk and deer called CWD, chronic wasting disease? It's uh, it's a it's not a virus. It's a prion, much smaller than a virus, and it attacks the brain so that the typically it's moose or elk, but it's happening with deer now. It, significant portions of population. It's affecting these animals in 24 states, and I think it may be more states, but the other states just don't have strong monitoring programs. But what they do is in the final stages. They just wander around in circles and circles and circles. If you Google it, you can see some really, they're kind of pathetic, real sad videos of these things. They just go around and around circle and that, you know, fish and wildlife guys just have to go out and euthanize them. 
You know, I suspect that's happening because these herds are too large. Uh, there aren't as many hunters anymore. There's just a lot of things that aren't done to manage, you know, these large populations like there used to be. You know, right. So, so when they get too big, nature's going to take over and, and handle that situation. That's interesting. I was wondering if, um, and the CDC, they don't know, you know, they're studying it, but um, whether this can be transferred to humans, and if it could be transferred to humans, they don't know yet, could it be transferred? Because I would think that an animal affected by the CWD, you know, elk or moose or deer, easy pickings for a Sasquatch. Right. And then would, wouldn't it be something if later on that started to spread within their species, their population? Yeah, there's no indication that, I mean, we don't, we don't hear about diseased ones. And I, I think, you know, like most animal populations, especially predators, they only kill off the, the sick ones. Um, so that's uh, not, probably where we're not seeing anything like that. And it, it may not affect them. Yeah, but that's interesting, Tom. Um, yeah, I haven't heard that, but I'll have to look that up. What's it called again? CWD, chronic wasting disease. Okay. Okay. And it kind of made me think, seriously rethink about Yeah, I thought about maybe getting back into, uh, you know, maybe doing some deer hunting or something. Um, maybe I'll sit tight on this for a bit. <laughs> yeah. I have enough mental problems. I don't need to add more to it. <laughs> uh, hey, Will, yeah. you had mentioned um, one time something called where the um, where the Sasquatch do territorial markings, mm -hmm. right? And can you can you elaborate on that, or what what exactly that is, and how you might you know what to look for if you're out in the woods? Well, the main type of marking. Um, is either snapped or twisted trees uh, and, okay. it, and it kind of depends on the fiber of the tree the type of tree so um in, in southern washington what i found uh I, you know originally bob titmus showed me this stuff and, and i wasn't too impressed with what he showed me because quite frankly what he showed me could have been done by anything but he told me he found he had and he had these little piles dozens of them all over in his house and they were nothing more than sticks maybe an inch thick uh, that had been snapped and kind of turned over and he says well when i when i find tracks when i'm tracking these things and following a line of tracks i find these you know periodically as i'm going along he says i don't know maybe they just walk along and grab a limb and twist it and or snap it and twist it over and i just kind of thought well you know i didn't know what to think about it so i just kind of put it in the back of my mind and this was in the mid 80s he was showing me this so come about 1991, a friend of mine and I were uh, deep in, in this watershed area up on a ridge, and I found a tree. We stopped for a break, and I happened to see this tree. And it was probably a, it was a dug fir tree about three inches thick. And I took my tape measure out when I, after I found this, and it was broken 90 degrees over. It had been freshly done. Um, the bark, nothing was damaged. It was just snapped over. It was a clean break, uh, eight feet off the ground, eight feet, one inches. And I ended up finding 13 more of those in a line about a hundred yards apart. And, um, uh, uh, an Indian, Indian friend of mine, Klamath Indian, I showed him pictures and he says, he kind of chuckled and he says, oh yeah, that's the Sasquatch's mark. I said, what do you mean it's mark? He says, yeah, they mark territory that way or... Uh, like what you found is a is a directional marker telling that's the the leader of the group telling the other ones which way to which way it went to the next feeding area and i thought oh well that's kind of interesting um and then a few years later uh, more than a few years later actually it was in uh probably 2004 or 5 i was in northern california and in the stand in the middle of this stand of uh, uh ponderosa pine young ones that were maybe you know, 10 feet tall or so, right in the very center. And these are all pretty close together, but it was a cluster of these little trees. There was one that was twisted, uh, again, seven or eight feet off the ground, uh, like you would take a wet rag, and it was about three inches thick, the trunk. 
and it was wrung like you would take a, a wet rag to wring the water out of it. And there were no claw marks, no nothing. It was like something just grabbed it with hands and, and wrung this thing. And, and there were even records. You know, we did, um, uh, we had Jim Sower who, uh, at the end of, end of each show, we have uh, a reading that Jim does. He narrates uh, stories for us. He did uh, Long Hunter Alaskan style. And I can't remember if that was last week's show or the one before. But anyway, um, the Alaska Indians showed these two trappers the mark of this creature. And, and when you read how it's described, it's exactly the same way. They said twisted like a matchstick. Well, the article, I think, was written in 1963. The incident probably happened 10, 20 years before that. So at that time period, there really weren't any paper matchsticks. They were all wooden. And I thought, well, how would you twist a wooden matchstick? You don't just twist it in the, the conventional sense we think of today. And I remember my dad and some of the old timers, they would talk about twisting things, and they meant snapping it. That was the term they used for, for snapping something. It wasn't just breaking, it was twisting it. And I thought, well, now isn't that interesting? Um, and I've seen this periodically. It's not something you find real often, but... Um, yeah, several of my, my native friends have told me the same thing, that, oh, yeah, that's their, that's their mark. You know, it's funny because I have seen that. You mentioned it in your book, and you showed pictures of it. And so in that area where, where I had my encounter, that was one of the things that really caught my attention as I was leaving. I was like, dang, look at that. Look at that tree. That, and I was, it was about eight feet tall, about three inches in diameter, all the trees around it were perfectly good shape. Nothing wrong with them. This thing had just been snapped over. And it's not weather damage. You can tell weather damage, no. especially if you live in the Northwest. You, you get pretty used to weather damage. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you, I always look for all the possible things it could be. And when I rule those out, it's pretty tough to, you know, come, come up with an explanation, especially when it's something that's freshly done. And, and if you didn't know what it was, you wouldn't pay any attention to it. Exactly. Yeah. So in that area, I, the friend of mine that we originally, you know, had that encounter with, he's still like, nah, I don't, I don't believe in it. But he'll humor me enough to go up there. And so I went up there and found six of these trees, and I'll, I, I plot them on my GPS. Mm -hmm. And I take a um, compass bearing, and then I plot that out on a either on Google Earth or, you know, on a quad map. I'm like, look at this. They all point in a line. Mm -hmm. they, they, they form a line, and then the last one points down at this lake. And I'm probably going to go check out that lake this summer with my brother. To get to it, you got to go down. You need mountain climbing equipment because it's just like the bottom of this pit, this hole. But anyway, that was. Um, I just thought that was interesting. That, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's it and and. And part of, I mean, that's only a very small piece. When you're, when you're talking about determining a range uh, for a group of these things, it, it's time-consuming because you have to know kind of where they are during each month of the year. So, And it takes a while to put that information together. Then once you start knowing, uh, for instance, if when they're in that particular area, you know, that might give you an indication of where they were to where they're going and it's not the same every year because they switch those areas all the time yeah uh, but at least it gives you kind of a, a foundation to work with yeah now will this is just kind of a theory so you can tell me if i'm totally off base with this but you you said that the tree breaks and the signs that they leave are either or it could be both but i guess but either a way to um mark their territory or to lead directions mm -hmm. for the, the ones. Okay, my, my theory would be that it would be the latter for directions because if these are the apex predators, they don't want to mark their territory to scare the other prey away. They, they would want to draw the prey in. So it doesn't seem, it doesn't make sense for them to like, you well, know, um, here's mark the thing, their though. territory. See, now a deer or an animal like that wouldn't know what that marking was. Uh, the marking would be primarily for other Sasquatches in different groups. Uh, if you see a single marking like that, it's usually a territorial marking. If you find a line of them, 
that's a directional marking and then also there is a third type uh, with the same type of marking uh, if there's an area of, of uh, routine human use or habitation they may mark the perimeter of that area as a warning right for other sasquatches you're saying correct right yeah okay gotcha okay yeah that makes sense yeah well that's interesting because that's what i found with the line and ultimately it seemed to point to a lake and i thought well hey you know maybe it's just saying hey there's water down here there's food down around there's something they want right uh down there and um so I just anyway, it's something that I'm going to check out. Right. When the snow melts right now. It's about five or six feet of snow up there, so <laughs> that's not going to happen. Well, Tom, very interesting. Glad you were able to come on. Good to hear from you again. Thank you. We're, yeah, we're running, absolutely. We're running a little bit short in your segment, um, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Come back again and and uh, you know join us for. Uh, we'll have to have you on the Q and A section. Awesome. I would appreciate that. That's great. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Um, good talking to you again. And um, you too. You too. all right. Thanks a bunch. All right, Tom. Okay. And if you need anything, you know, photographically, you know, to, to help out with uh, talking to people, you know, get a hold of me and, and I'll send you stuff. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll take you up on that. Thanks, Will. All right, Tom. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, yeah, you too. Thanks. All right, folks, let's see. Hey, so, so Will, um, I was going to ask you, our, uh, that happy camp that, that he was talking about, that's really close to the Bluff Creek area? It's it's kind of northeast of there, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Well, Brian, let's uh, go ahead and dive into the Q&A section of oh. the show, folks. That's we're going to, uh, again, thank Tom for joining us, but, uh, you know, interesting information he had. And, Brian, before we jump into this, uh, go ahead and give out your information folks we have next week we have our our forensic anthropologist coming on the show so any questions you would have uh, regarding anthropology or, or the scientific end of this you know send them to Brian so that we can uh, we're gonna put him in the hot seat <laughs> yeah absolutely so just uh, any questions just send them to Orlando outsider at yahoo.com that's Orlando outsider one word at yahoo.com and for anybody that's been asking about the uh the origin of that name it's just because i'm from michigan so when i moved down here in 2006 <laughs> i just felt like an outsider so that's just kind of the orlando outsider that i <laughs> adopted <laughs> so well brian what questions do we have for this week okay so first of all uh, this is from donald who left a, a comment on youtube uh and um uh, now, now keep in mind. I think that we did. In fact, I know that we've we've covered this before. But maybe this this may have been the segment with Milo that, or maybe the week after that that got cut off. So maybe uh, that he didn't hear this, but he just had a question about the the cabin from the 1924 attack. Is it still there, or did the eruption from Mount uh, St. Helens make it disappear. I know, I know that we covered it, but maybe he didn't hear, or maybe that it got cut off from the recording from before. So, well, we, uh, I actually, I think last week I attached the, uh, the, the, uh, narration that Jim did on that right. particular story. And, and Fred Beck stated in there actually clearly, uh, that the cabin for unknown reasons burnt down in the 1960s. Um, mm -hmm. And it's funny, you know, people people have all kinds of opinions on that. They say they don't know where the cabin was um, and all these things, and it was lost, and, you know, it wasn't. I mean, um, I was given the location, and actually Fred Beck in his story, in the telling, was very specific about where the cabin was located. It was just on the north side of the head of Ape Canyon, what's called Ape Canyon today. And um, the college student that I spoke with gave me the location. They had researched it and knew exactly where it was. When we went there, you could still find, you know, nails and, and some stuff like that, a little bit of debris. Uh, so we, we camped where the site of the cabin was, so we knew exactly where it was. But the cabin's gone. Yeah. 
And what is the state of that? I mean, this is my question, I guess. What is the state of that area overall? I mean, is it? Uh, I mean, how has it changed since the the eruption? Well, the north Just... side of the mountain, of course, changed a great deal. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of the terrain on the eastern side, and of course, the south is still very much like it was. Um, on the east side, of course, there was ash. A lot of the timber was destroyed, but the terrain is still there. But all that's grown back. I mean, it's it's thick forest around the mountain today. Yeah, I mean, is there any danger that it's going to erupt again anytime soon? Or actually, it, it erupts periodically. Uh, oh, it doesn't? I've I've dri- I've driven by there. Well, before I moved to California. In fact, when I was there last year for my birthday, um, you you occasionally can see steam coming up out of the out of the mountain, and, and you will have little little eruptions occasionally. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so also this is from Donald. He asks, I don't know if this is just meant for like the the Jebdine Research Group or just I, I think people over or researchers overall. But he says, do you think that there's a possibility that your researchers are embellishing a little bit? Um, I have my own answer to that, but uh, I'll let you handle, handle yours first if you want. Well. I guess I guess depends on whether we're talking about our people in the JRG or people in general. Uh, if we talk about people in general, uh, there's a lot of embellishment out there. I hate to say that, but there really is. And sometimes it's inadvertent. Sometimes it's on purpose. So, you know, the, your guess is as good as mine on that. There's a lot of things I see that I um, I just kind of shake my head about because. Yeah, I know. I know things are made up in a lot of cases. Yeah. Well. Well. Here's my take on that. Uh, it's a. It's a really good question, by the way. It is from Don. I, I think it's a really good question, but I, I. I think that there are kind of two. There's like a demarcation, if you will. There are there, on one hand, you have uh, people that are legitimate in their stories, and I don't think they're embellishing. I think that like, when they talk about the terror and the horror of their experiences oh, and the yeah. fear they feel. I think that that's absolutely real. I don't think there's any embellishing that at, at all. But on the other side, I think there's a lot of fabrication throughout history, even throughout today that we know about. And uh, I mean, I mean, we don't have to say names, but I mean, it goes on and on. So I think there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of fabrication, mm-hmm. not necessarily embellishment from the people that are legitimate, but uh, from the people on the other side that are fabricating information, oh yeah, they embellish a lot. <laughs> I, I think I think when you tell what happened to you, um, I know I used to do I, what I used to do with mine was I would tell it too quick. I'd rush through the story and leave out a lot of details. Um, when I when I wrote in search of the unknown, I actually sat down and had to think about that. Um, you know, actually walk myself through step by step everything happened and try to dig up all those memories and um so when people tell things i mean it especially depends on what's in their frame of reference you know if right. they don't know how to describe some particular thing they don't have words for or an, or an experience for you know they'll put together the best they can and it's not an embellishment necessarily it's just um, a witness trying to do the best they can to explain something that's unexplainable yeah, like that's why I want to have uh, Sam on here because what you know, uh, Tom's cousin or her his cousin's uh, uh, wife, right? And I heard him because what he was saying is that, especially in his email, he was saying that, I mean, the the terror in her voice, the fear in her voice was just so real that there's no way that they're making it up. I mean, it's uh, there, there's no way that they're embellishing like all the experience that they felt came through in genuine emotion and it's different than just making up stories or adding details or anything like that it's just true raw emotion and i can i can certainly side with that um i i've interviewed many people and and it's very difficult a lot of times for them to retell because they're reliving the experience and, yeah. and they will get very emotional uh on the other hand people who talk about an experience that should have been very emotional, yes. had no emotion whatsoever, uh, especially fairly close after the incident took place. Yeah, yeah. And then um, uh, Donald also asks, have you ever heard of Sasquatch Odyssey? I guess they do another um, 
I'm not sure if it's a, uh, like a podcast or whatever, but um, he said that we should check them out. So I'm not sure if you ever heard of Sasquatch Odyssey. Uh, I've probably heard the name, but yeah, um, I, I don't. I don't really listen to other shows or watch things on TV about the subject very much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So moving on um, from Dave, also uh, some good questions here. He says, "Okay, uh, how do tracks just stop and disappear on a trackway when following them?" Um, and I'm not sure exactly what the the logic of that means, but I think that, I think well, that how to how to follow them. Like he he says, "How do tracks just stop and disappear on a trackway?" Well, it depends on the material that they're they're being walked on and sometimes uh it it may be possible we don't know for sure but it it could be possible that these things are smart enough to occasionally hide their tracks um you know to walk in a place where they're not going to leave prints yeah yeah um now that's an unknown so yeah yeah okay so actually i think that (laughs) this is kind of a lead way to the next question which i'm going to ask you this is probably going to make no sense unless you can explain it to me um, I do have an answer to this, mm-hmm. but I want to get your answer first. He says, okay, how do batteries and electrical electrical devices have issues or somehow don't work at all when going into areas when they are around? Um, well, it's, it's not because of the Sasquatch. <laughs> it's, yeah. I, I'll tell you, you know, and this, this is something, um, I, I learned in the army at the non, in the non commissioned officers academy, <laughs> and yeah. p- part part the language, folks. But the, the instructor and, and he drilled this into us, and it's about it's about preparation. You know, he says he says if you follow the six P's, you'll never be caught with your pants down. And the six P's were, um, oh geez, now I lost my train of thought there. Oh, it's prior planning prevents piss poor performance. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and it's very true i mean if before you go and i see this i see this at work i see people coming in and and they've got their equipment and half the time it doesn't work their batteries and things don't work it's because they didn't check it before they started out it's not it's not the and i'll t- i had i had a friend of mine this guy was you know a brilliant individual i'm, I'm sure he never talked about his background education, but I have no doubt he had at least one PhD, probably two or three of them. Um, we would go out to the field often, and my cameras always worked because I always checked them before leaving in the night before, made sure they had fresh batteries, things like that. He had this very expensive uh, Nikon camera, and I swear he never took a picture because the thing's batteries were always not working non-functional and and i think it was because he was uh, a very cerebral type person I, I just don't think he was caught up in those details of of making sure you know kind of dummy proofing your equipment to make sure it works properly um <laughs> and, and, and that's a term we used to the military too was dummy proofing you know you have to kind of do it with yourself to make sure that your stuff is going to actually work so i think that's more the problem and, and it's not okay. because of the sasquatch um, yeah, and, and just kind of follow up on that, um, the, the question about why do tracks just stop and disappear suddenly, and why do batteries and electrical devices somehow don't work, I think where this comes from, and I'm, I, I don't want to um, incriminate Dave, I mean, he's a, this is a, these are good questions, but I, think good that, questions yeah. but, I, but I think that he may have got this from a different show or a different podcast um, that I recall listening to. Um, one episode too, where this person said, "Oh well, he put up these uh, sensors on four of his like areas, like four of his borders, and all of a sudden, like uh, one device didn't work, and then um, the next day, the the other, then they, he put the new batteries in, and then it went out went out again, and then the same thing happened with the other four devices, and then um, because this this person who was who was supposedly monitoring this area knew that a sasquatch is coming into that area and for some reason all of the electrical devices just kept going out every time every night um that the sasquatch would come in and steal the bait or the chicken or whatever they had out there um all of a sudden you know all the, the cameras wouldn't work isn't and that then, coincidental 
Yeah, it's not, it's not cool to know. And then also, also, um, the, the same person somehow saw lights every time that they saw a Sasquatch coming. They saw lights um, on the roof of his house. They saw lights in the woods. And then all like so. My main point is that um, you have to be careful about the the shows out there that you listen to because a lot of them are garbage. We won't say names, but a lot of those people are, uh, for lack of a better word, hoaxers. So well, they you, put a lot of when we they talk, put a lot of misinformation out there. <laughs> right when you when you talked about embellishing, the, I think that's a good example of embellishment. Well, I, not not no not embellishment. I, I would say fabrication. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, wit, the the people that they bring on there are just um, maybe paid actors or you know whatever. But again, we won't go into that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I mean, it, I don't know. You know, here's the thing: if you've got equipment out now, number one, they're going to avoid stuff in their area anyway because primates do that in particular, especially man-made objects. If it doesn't belong in their environment, they're going to avoid it. Now. If your equipment happens to go out and it's hidden well, um, what's the corroborating evidence that proves the Sasquatch was actually there? Were there a line of tracks? Was there, you know, th there has to be some kind of evidence. You have to be able to support those arguments. You can't just say, oh, well, it took the bait and the equipment didn't work. Okay, prove it. Yeah, exactly. And the whole thing about lights, like, I'm not sure if you've heard of that, but that's another thing that a lot of these uh, people are saying now. These these people are saying that there are lights, light sources that come from trees, and especially after UFO incidents, they see lights in trees, and then all of a sudden there's a Bigfoot out there. Uh, the whole lights thing um, is it's just ridiculous to me. You remember when we had Lee on, he talked about, and he did some research, he actually called, I think, Nikon. And it's actually in a lot of SLR camera manuals, digital cameras. Um, and I can't remember the exact... Well, after, he's going to come on again sometime. I'll have him elaborate on it. But uh, the cameras can actually... Digital cameras can actually have uh, an artifact on pictures that actually looks like a, a light, an orb or whatever, what have yeah. you. Uh, as far as people seeing them, I don't know about that, but... Uh, as far as the, the camera itself, when you see pictures of stuff like that, that's easily explained. Yeah. Well, the point is that I think that a lot of these people are just, a lot of the people out there are, are sometimes making stories up that, <laughs> that you have to be careful about um, l listening to and taking it too literally because these people, some of these people out there are crazy. And we have the history of, the subject where we know that to be true and, where you and, have, and people yeah. want sometimes there's there are a certain amount of people out there that want to believe that kind of stuff so when they yeah. hear the story it's like wow there it is that's that's what i believe you know you, you got to be a little more critical in your thinking yeah yeah um and, and also last question from dave uh he just wants to know when they throw things do they throw from like the standpoint, like we do, like overhand, or is it more of a sidearm, or is it, is it, I guess either or is what he's asking. You know, it's hard telling. I don't think anybody knows. Yeah. I yeah. don't think I don't think I've ever heard of anybody actually see one throwing an object. I doubt that it's similar to what we do, because um, I mean, if you watch chimps throw things, it's not exactly the same way we throw things. Right. Right. It's prob It's probably more like that. Right, exactly. That's what I was thinking too. Hey, so here, I guess here are some of my questions. Uh, when witnesses do t tell police or whatever authority uh, about what they've seen, if they've encountered one of these creatures, um, what what, are the, what is the police reaction most of the time that you've heard? Are they are the witnesses kind of laughed out of the building completely, or do the police kind of take time to listen to their story? No, usually, usually it's, uh, they kind of laugh at them. I, I've, I've talked to people that have actually had the police come out after a sighting onto their property. Um, you know, they go look, they, they humor the people, but that's as far as it goes. I mean, it's not, it's not ever treated very credibly. Yeah. It does make you wonder how many reports that they get and they just roll their eyes and they 
from from people that have not really seen one of these things, but they just report it or or no. not the Sasquatch. Yeah, no, it could that's, be. No, that's on the surface. That's that's how the witnesses, you know, see see the law enforcement acting now. Whether they know more or told more or not is hard to tell. We don't know that because I've talked to a number of law enforcement people who said, "Oh yeah, we we have the we have a specific code for these things and and so on." Um, and are told to handle handle these stories in a different manner, um, but that's not across the board. It depends on yeah. on specific law enforcement agencies and, and other factors. Yeah, well, this that, I guess that's a good segue to this next question. Would be like, what percentage of police departments or police individuals, I guess, officers individual, believe in the subject? Uh, in your estimation, that's hard telling. It's probably you'd have to look at the cross section of the population. Uh, I think it would correspond because they're average folks like everybody else. Um, and it, depending on a person's beliefs or experiences. Yeah. And it might also, I guess, depend on the location too, because I'm sure the Pacific Northwest might be a lot different than, you know, um, the, the Southeast or something like that. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and okay, here's here's kind of a interesting question. Were there, without going into names or whatever, but were there any witnesses on the old show or any old shows that you you've been on where you interviewed somebody that, uh, without the obvious one, but uh, but in any interviews with people that you thought were credible at first, but then later on, or maybe maybe even as the interview progressed, began to think that they were lying. Uh, well. <laughs> Yeah, or just or just imagining things that happened to him. Um, I, I heard one, one or two Lulus, <laughs> and I, I'm not gonna. I'm not. I don't want to embarrass the people, so I'm not gonna say any specifics. But there there were a few times um, that I'd be listening, and uh, I just thought, "Ooh, <laughs> this, this is a whopper." This one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because, yeah, I mean, how many people have you, you've interviewed thousands of people, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. So the vast majority of them were probably telling the truth, but at, at some point, at, there were got to be some of them where you said, oh, my gosh. Yeah, I, don't... I, I mean, <laughs> and, and more do, I guess more doing podcasting, you know, when you go out and meet people, because you can, you're, you're standing there with them, talking to them, you can gauge a lot from body language and, and the, their voice and things like that. Uh, not just the details of the story, but there, there are other factors that take come into play there. But uh, you, when you're doing podcasting, you know, especially if you don't meet the person or, or a lot of times I would be, I would was put into a situation before where um, I didn't really know much about the witness coming on and, and just was sort of interjected into the, uh, doing the interview and, uh, you know, yeah. you, you don't know what you're getting sometimes with that, but, um, yeah. And let me ask a follow up to that too, related to that. I mean, I got, I guess I know the answer, but, uh, how much more important is it, is, is it to interview the witness and, and look at the evidence that they're talking about before interviewing them, um, in person, as opposed to just doing it over the internet or on phone Etc. It's a world of difference. Um, yeah. I'll give you an example. Well, I always like the, the occult thing with the Goldhammer family. Uh, I sat yeah. down with them very informally and, and just yeah. chatted. And then I, I actually, through the course of interviewing them, we probably went over the incident a dozen times. And I was, right. and I was doing that to see if they were changing any of the details. Right. Yeah, and also on, on that note too, um, because I, again, I know the answer to this, but I mean, if you are are talking to somebody about a story or an encounter that they had, and there are more than one people, just like a police officer, mm -hmm. you, you want to separate them, right? You want right. to you want to separate. You want each of them to tell the story in their own words, 
separate them and then tell the other and have the other person tell the story in their, in their own words as well to kind of match up the details and that is a good way of identifying whether they are telling the truth or not absolutely and when i would take a team into a place uh, or to a location where we had witnesses that's exactly what we would do we would it was kind of unspoken who was going to go where but we would we would divide up and and take each of the the witnesses you know to have a have them show us different locations or or uh some of the people were really good they, they'd make up something they'd want to go look at something and then they'd talk to that person out of earshot of yeah. each of the others so and and then we would talk privately away from the witnesses and compare notes and then maybe switch people and, and yeah. go talk to them again and, and see you know to see if things continue to match up or not yeah, exactly. Because I used to watch a lot of those cop shows, uh, or or the you know Dateline or uh, Forensic Files or some of the ones on court, the old Court TV. Right now, I, now it's True TV, and uh, that's exactly what the the law enforcement would say is that they would purposely separate all the witnesses, whether it's two people or three people or four people, and have them tell exactly what happened in their own words. Mm-hmm. They would look for uh, commonalities that would that would come about for from each story and i think it's true with with, uh with these things too and we had situations and like the one i've mentioned a number of times you know we went to the place and and the the lady of the house was uh you know had a pretty fertile imagination but it was through the course of doing this process we discovered that it was two of the the young teenagers who actually had the experience um, yeah, where you know anybody else who would have gone there, uh, you know, claiming to investigate the situation would have talked to the mother, and and that's the only story that would have come out. We had to actually do some digging and and doing the switching around of questioning, you know, our our people investigating, our investigators talking to these people, before right. we actually were able to dig that up that it was these two young people. Yeah, because they weren't there with us. Uh, they were actually kind of shying away, and, and eventually uh, one of our people um, went over to talk to these two young people, and that's how we found out. Yeah. And, I mean, I, I guess that's the difference between researchers like you and other people out there that are just maybe trying to make a book or, uh, or uh, you know, like – one example that I'll give in recent news is that whole Jesse Smollett case mm-hmm. where he, he made he made up a story and at first everybody believed it and then the police once they dug into the details they found out the story that he was actually making it up and I think that's that's what the same care and um, uh, detail needs to go into every single investigation even with these creatures that's 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 what lacks the bfro i think that's what they lack yeah it's it's actually it's much tougher to do it you know through you know like an audio uh interview over the phone or or like we do on the show yeah. it's it's much better to be on site mm-hmm. um and and to use that process mm-hmm. and not just the process then you then you implement searching you have to there are proper searches to do and I, and I um Mike that we had on last week I'm sending him a copy of my uh, yeah. Bigfoot Fieldwork 101 book uh to help him do the work more properly and it's 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 a good foundation because it kind of teaches you those things and it's important to do those kinds of processes because you get different perspectives on what's happening as you're conducting right. that investigation it's too right. easy to go out like most people do. They go to a spot, they talk to a witness, they they do a real casual look around of the immediate spot, and and that's their whole investigation. Well, sorry folks, that's not much of an investigation. Um, yeah. You have to really dig into the details. Exactly. You have to yeah. go back. You have to keep looking. Even if you might go a hundred times and not see anything in an area, uh, but that's valuable information too. Right, right. And the 77th time that you go in there, you might pick up on one little detail that, exactly. again, might not, seem, it might not seem interesting at first, but then the 99th time you go in there, you'll, you'll find that it relates to something else, and you can kind of connect the dots and so forth. I always felt like I was just beating my head against a brick wall, going into <laughs> some places, not seeing something. And then, like you said, 
uh, it, through the course of just going through those places, um, you know, your mind, at least mine does, that goes through all kinds of different pathways. And, yeah. and after a while, or, you know, something might trigger a different perspective. And I'll think, oh, I never thought of that, uh, of whatever <laughs> the circumstance was. Yeah. And, and, it, and it might lead you down a different pathway. So um, you kind of have to take your time. It's, it is time consuming. Take your time. You don't be rushed. Consider everything that's going on. Consider the yeah. history of the area. There's just so much going on in these places. Yeah, you have to be like uh, Jessica Fletcher and Murder, She Wrote, or like my favorite uh, author of all time, Agatha, Agatha Christie, mm-hmm. and, and uh, Hercule Perot, or whatever, um, how you pr- ever pronounce that, uh, great detective. But, um, but uh, hey, how much how much time do we have? Uh, we, we have plenty of time. Oh, okay, okay. So I was going to ask you about, okay, the potential aftermath of when the creature is finally found to be real, okay, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, just your overall gut reaction. Like, what do you think is going to happen if, like, tomorrow morning we wake up and somebody says, hey, we have a Bigfoot captured uh, alive or dead. What do you think is going to be the reaction of America? Well, I think all the people that think people who would get involved in this are crazy are going to do a complete flip-flop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, officially, I mean, of course, the Endangered Species Act kicks in right away. Um, yeah. And, and of course, that, that'll be a big deal because they'll have to make a lot of determinations. And it, they have to do a study. And, of course, this is big because they're every place. Um, and I don't know how they're going to handle that in terms of, of shutting areas down to commerce because, uh, you know, forest products, things like that, to make a determination about habitat and all that kind of stuff and keeping people out of those places that's going to be a a handful all by itself but uh, that'll be the first thing that kicks in and after that it's hard telling it depends on what the federal or state laws do in terms of um, how they administer these things yeah I mean because what I was thinking is, number one, there's going to be huge embarrassment from the scientific community. Uh, all of these scientists that keep saying that it's not real and the evidence doesn't match up and uh, the Patterson film was a hoax and on and on it goes. But I think that they're really going to feel a lot of embarrassment. And they should. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, well, whether, just, whether it has yeah, any just, long-lasting effects or not, that's another story, but... Yeah. Well, just as they should have when they um, didn't discover the Billy Ape until 1996, right? But everybody knew it existed. <laughs> well, but, I, you know, that's just it. Scientists are supposed to go out and find the proof, to either yeah. prove or disprove something, not wait for laymen to go out and drag, you know, the, the yeah. definitive proof into them, and then they run around and, and make big claims and write books and get the Nobel Prize and things like that. That's not how it's supposed to work. Well, that's my point exactly, is that uh, the scientific community should feel embarrassed because they are the scientists. They are the ones to go out and discover, quote-unquote, discover That's correct. New, new information. And it, when it takes somebody from the streets, <laughs> from you know, a farmland or whoever it might be to actually come up and prove that this existence. I mean, they should just feel really, really embarrassed and kind of ashamed. Yeah, I, I would, people need to get off their fat backsides, teaching classes at colleges and get out and do a re get out and do the work. Exactly. Uh, that, that, by the way, that that's one, one of the reasons why I kind of admire people like Jane Goodall, who actually went out and did um, right. research in the field or, or, uh, other people like that that do research in the field not just in colleges and right so forth. there there are good scientists out there there really are that really work hard uh and do the job that they're supposed to do there's just plenty of them that are, are you know they lump themselves in the same grouping and they really shouldn't be lumped in the same grouping you know if yeah they want to yeah. sit around write papers and and think highly of themselves and have a nice little comfortable career that's fine and dandy but if you're going to call yourself a scientist, well, you need to be on the cutting edge. Yeah. 
And this, the other thing, too, I think that there would be embarrassment from the public, the general public, because even though uh, I was actually going to bring this up to Tom, um, because when we were talking about the um, like, do do people believe in this and so forth? Uh, I, there was a, a poll in The Washington Post a couple years ago that said that I think 35 percent of people believe in the creature, but something like 60 percent 60 65 percent of people are definitely willing to believe that it could exist but there were other like you know 35 percent of people that said oh wait no no way no how it doesn't exist and i think there's going to be embarrassment from the public a lot of people in the public that just made fun of people like uh like you and and some of these other researchers out there and i think there's going to be embarrassment from them and again there should be i i think and again, the numbers you stated there, you know, if there's 60, 60 percent people out there, that's our what I call skeptics. They're, yeah. they're willing to. But, you you know, they're they're sitting on the fence. They'll go either way, depending on uh, the evidence or proof put in front of them. Yeah. And that's either for or against. It's not, uh, you know, not one sided or the other. But, you know, the public, you know how they, they are, though, they'll, they'll, they'll just uh those skeptics, they'll just say, oh, well, I always, they'll change their tune of thought. They'll just say, oh, well, I, I thought it could exist. I just never, I never dismiss it all entirely. Even right, though they they'll, they'll morph into something <laughs> more acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, the last thing, too, and this is kind of very personal to me, because I was a journalism major, my undergraduate in college, um, I think that you're going to have a lot of embarrassment from respected journalists who have kind of mocked this subject uh even when you read subjects or even when you read articles about this topic and they start off by trying to say that oh well hey maybe this creature exists they kind of laugh it off and say hey nobody really believes this creature exists and so forth but i I really think that the journalism field in general especially since i graduated i graduated my undergrad in uh, 1997 and i could just tell you it's the whole field has gone really downhill since mm-hmm. then, and I think that a lot of journalists will lose a lot. Not they won't lose credibility because I don't think they have a lot of credibility, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but I just think that there'll be there there should be some embarrassment from that field. Well, I, you know, I I can see that, especially um, you know, I've mentioned before about doing uh, interviews with reporters, and and even. Even if they're well intentioned, yeah. you know, sometimes uh, that little um, attitude can creep into an article. Uh, yeah, and and it's too bad because and, and I now I, I've I've actually dealt with some pretty good news people that have written yeah. written good articles, uh, but yeah. you know there there's always some out there that'll. Um, I, I remember when we did the uh, the barbecue and potluck at Mount St. Helens in 1992. Uh, there was a, a a lot of newspaper and radio people that uh, Renee wanted to take away from on the second day. He wanted to take them away from what we were doing. We were we had a so, kind of a social setting, kind of a little brunch type setting in different locations throughout the campground, so that uh, my staff and I could meet yeah. with anybody who had an encounter. And which and it was very successful. We had all these little stations where, you know, we had like uh, pastry and coffee, and one of one of my staff was in each one of these locations. So people would kind of congregate around those, around the fires and such, and and sit and talk to our, our people about their encounters. We collected a lot of information, and Rene wanted to take the the reporters away from that setting. He didn't want them interrupting that because a lot of people didn't want to talk around news people. So he says, I, "I'm going to take the take the the busybodies or whatever off on a trip." So he took him off to um, the ape caves or something like that, <laughs> a few miles away from us. But uh, he didn't have a real high opinion of that attitude either, you know. So yeah. he wanted to remove that from what we were doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there there are definitely some good uh, journalists out there. I mean, oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, so so yeah, some of them really do their job, but a lot of them are just just they just kind of mock people that uh, believe in the subject. I mean, like you know, people like uh, uh, why am I drawing up like uh, Walter Cronkite? I mean, he he was a good journalist. Uh, you know, Laura Lagan from 
from 60 Minutes recently. Mm-hmm. That she kind of retired from the industry <laughs> because she's so sick of it. But <laughs> what's the uh, – why am I drawing a blank? The 1960s, um, CBS – I'm drawing a blank uh, of his name, but but anyway, so there are there are a lot of good journalists out there, but um, I just think that it'd be nice the, if they were would report without inter- interjecting their opinions. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but um, also, you know, I I also think that if this creature were discovered officially once and for all. I think that it would also change the reputation of uh, academics in general. I would hope like so. I, yeah, because I think that they're – like everybody in academia – like I, I just told you and Tom, I think that it's changing because more people are, are waking up to the subject. But there has been so much written about, oh, this is a hoax and so forth. And um, I, I think that people would have a different – uh, attitude towards academic experts, quote unquote, academic experts nowadays, because they understand that hey, what was in the past is not necessarily in the future. And I don't, and think, it's, I don't think oh, it's I don't think it's necessarily all their fault either, because um, when we get the the really crazy stuff, you know, like the interdimensional <laughs> junk and all this kind of nonsense, <laughs> yeah. and, and the hoaxes um, gets blasted out there so much. And I think when they when they they take a, a cautious look at the subject, they see this junk and then you know want to try. Yeah. I, don't, I don't blame them for wanting to turn away from it, uh, yeah. which is really unfortunate because yeah. when there's so much really good material, um, yeah. they don't allow themselves to be exposed to that. Yeah, and, and just to add to that too, because I think you're right. I just think that the subject has been so uh, tarnished by some of these hoaxes that a lot of people in academia haven't really taken it seriously. Right, and right from the beginning, ne- too. Yeah, and that's not necessarily their fault, but um, if they were covering the subject, which I know that a lot of them don't, but if they were to cover the, the subject, they should go into deeper to that. But, like you said, I, I totally agree that it's been... In fact, we should have a whole show sometime on just the hoaxes that have been perpetuated throughout history. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, oh, everybody always thinks about the Patterson film. Um, and of course, you know, initially Ray Wallace is one that he claimed he, he made all the footprints, you know, yeah. but, and so people would think, oh, well, okay, that's all fake. You know, they dismiss, they dismiss what's in front of their eyes on the film instead of asking the question, why did Ray Wallace make this claim and do, does his claim stand up? Well, the fact his claim doesn't stand up because when you look at all the footprints that were found, over a decade in that area, not one of them match his wooden feet. Yeah. So there's no credibility to, to his claim. Yeah, absolutely. The same thing with uh, the whole Bob Hieronymus thing, claiming he wore the suit. Well, that's utter nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't need to go into all the details on that. We can, we can, like I said, we can do a show talking about hoaxes, but and go into some detail on some of those things, but. You know, people want to just dismiss what they see in front of their eyes instead of questioning the person who makes the claim of hoaxing and why and the motivation for making that claim in the first place. Right, right. And also kind of continuing this idea of academia, I bet you would see a lot of dissertations that would come out now. Oh, yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah. Uh, how science was wrong for doing for um, misinterpreting the evidence and so forth, and and also what imp- implications this means for the future. Like what other uh, creatures might be out there? It would be and a hot. Have, it would be a hot topic for some time. Yeah, and also the future of science and academia. Like uh, we should not be easily dismissing some creatures that are purported to be out there uh, before really doing an evaluation and seeing the evidence. And just like you said, just like a police detective. I I think it's sort of, I've always thought of this subject as sort of a forerunner to the change in our thinking before we get out and really, you know, find life in the universe. You know, if we, if we can't deal with this, 
how in the world are we going to go out and deal with something much bigger? Exactly. You know, exactly. Our, our attitude has to change. Right. So, in other words, this could be a microcosm. Yeah. A macrocosm. Right. Exactly. And um, also, so there would be, a, I imagine, a huge amount of uh, dissertation, new dissertations about the subject. Oh, yeah. And, and definitely a reimagine a reimagining of the stories that were that and also the articles and so forth that were dismissed about the Patterson film I, because I everybody said yeah Patterson was a was a hoaxer and everything like that but hey that that would be a whole new topic now you know it, it, here's something too that I think about um, you know let's say like I said tomorrow we find out everybody finds out they're real all the people that have been keeping them their stories to themselves I, I think it would be like opening the floodgates you know yeah. because they would be vindicated so they'd be okay yeah. with talking about what they experienced absolutely uh yeah patterson and gimlin would be totally vindicated exonerated whatever you want, mm -hmm. want to call it and they'd be given newfound recognition oh yeah and now all of a sudden all these people that say that uh you know obviously patterson died a long time ago but but Gimlin, everybody that says that he's he's not true and he's he's not telling the truth and everything and he's a liar and blah blah blah, uh, he would probably be given now new found res and respected. Right, and uh, and I think that the original pioneers of the subject would be given their credit too. Right, like the Hinden and yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, also, I was going to ask too. Uh, speaking of scientists. Do you know of any uh, who, anyone who that maybe you or that you've met directly or just read or heard about that have examined evidence at one time who believe in the subject but are perhaps reluctant to speak out about it? I know, I know that you from oh, the yeah. government. I, oh, know, yeah. I know that you have Mr. Black and everything. Mr. Black's plural, right. but but. Are there any like scientists that you've talked to that know about the subject but are scared to freak, fr you know, freak out about it and, and tell everybody about it? Just not just for the sake of being embarrassed, but maybe because they could lose their jobs. Yeah, and, and I actually have a few. Um, I'm thinking three specifically off the top of my head. I, there are a few more, but um, who are involved and. Um, you know, we'll we'll examine whatever I bring them, uh, and and give you know a good a good solid opinion on that evidence. In fact, I've got stuff going to two of them currently. Oh no, all three of them actually. Let me think. No, two of them. Two of them. Interesting, and that just makes you wonder too that uh, you're doing you're you know of two, but there could be a lot of people out there as well, other scientists out there as well that. Are in the same position. Yeah, I would. Where they probably know something. I, I yeah. would. I would actually love to have scientists become involved. I mean, on a confidential basis, because I know it's very tricky for them and their professions to get caught up in something that could yeah. end their career. <laughs> um, yeah. But you know, if if they're willing to look at in, uh, evidence that we have, then by all means, you know, we totally. And I, like I said, I have several right now. We do work on a very confidential basis, so. Uh, but they're very open-minded. They're very willing to look at stuff. Yeah, it is kind of very optimistic that there is that uh, group of uh, people out there that are are willing to take the evidence seriously, even if it's confidentially. At least they can talk to us in secret and uh, and and share information and, and so forth. Yeah, I mean, it's nice to have, and, and you know, even our, our forensic anthropologist, I'm, I'm not going to mention his name because I, I think he wants to keep his name out of stuff for the moment. He used to work mm. with the court systems here in the Bay Area, so, I mean, he was really uh, in a position then. It's, it's a little more lax for him now, but um, when he was here, I mean, you could imagine the credibility issues if somebody, when he went to court to testify about some... Um, scientific work that he had done uh you know the the opposing side would be totally shoot him down and he would never work again but uh, yeah. in a court case but um like i guess he's he's yeah. out of that system now but and he used to teach here also uh, that's the one i mentioned you know he he when he contacted me he'd listened to a few of the shows 
uh, or interviews that I had uh, had done in the past. And, and he was impressed with the work, which was knowing the guy and, and how brilliant he is. It was quite a compliment. And he said that uh, the show Finding Bigfoot, he used to play that for his students occasionally at the college and uh, tell them that was an example of bad science. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> he, he's, he's actually a pretty hilarious guy, too, but he, really brilliant. It, it's going to be uh, really fun to have him on next week, so... Uh, you mean the show Not Finding Bigfoot, right? Right, right, correct. <laughs> yeah, he said he used to use that as an example of bad science for his students. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, the thing I always say about that show is that it, you know that they're never going to find Bigfoot because if they ever did, that show is shot in advance. So there would be news about it beforehand. So you know that when you're watching the show, you're not going to find Bigfoot because if you are going to find Bigfoot in that show, it would have been reported in advance. Oh, yeah. So it just... The whole show doesn't make sense to me, but um, <laughs> anyways. <laughs> but uh, the other thing too, though, about if Bigfoot were discovered tomorrow, I think that there would be, in it probably a good way, it, well, good maybe some bad ways, but there would probably be in a good way a lot of new Hollywood movies and also horror fiction novels. Oh yeah, about the story. I think it would actually open up some of the creativity because Hollywood as I think we all know is lacking in creativity. Everything right now is a remake or a sequel oh, or yeah. it's, it's just, it's just uh, yeah. bo- boring. The stuff that they're doing, yeah. there's no creativity. Yeah. So it would be cool. And also, cause I know that, um, Sikander wanted to, uh, maybe d- do something like this too. We could, uh, we, we can work on that more. Um, we'll talk about that later, but um, yeah, we, we won't talk about that stuff on the air. <laughs> yeah. But um, unfortunately, though, too, if Bigfoot were to dis- dis- be discovered tomorrow, probably this is a bad thing. A bunch of new theories and interest in bogus subjects like, you know, the whole dogman thing and the alien theory, all that stuff would kind of open up again. They'll, you know, you'd have new theories about the Loch Ness Monster and everything. It would, well, so there's not a thing bad it, One um, thing it might do, I mean, more yeah. nuts and bolts kind of things like, let's say, lake monsters or what have you um and and that's that's the area to hinden wanted to go into when he was finished with bigfoot of course he didn't get to go that way but uh, you know there, there there could be some interest some serious interest at, uh taken in something like that but um you know things like dogman I, I think once these things were proven to be real and, and scientists really started focusing on understanding them, they'd figure out that that stuff was all nonsense. So, um, yeah. I, I mean, there, there would be a, there would be kind of a sorting out of things. Uh, of course you'd, you'd have the crowd that says, well, look at this, these things are real. Then all this other stuff's got to be real. But, uh, I think that would fall by the wayside fairly quick. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we covered this before when we were talking to Tom, but there were some people that were saying that, some of these "quote unquote" unfound species, such as Sasquatch, uh, might go extinct before they're ever discovered for scientists. But and, and that might be true for some species, but I don't think that will happen with Bigfoot because I think not with these things. No, well, yeah, these are growing, not shrinking, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, the population is large enough; it wouldn't wouldn't just die out. Yeah, yeah. Now. Let me ask you, do you still, how often do you go out there looking for <laughs> the creature? Or do you even, have you retired from that? <laughs> no, I never get tired. I mean, sometimes if I get busy, um, you know, I'll, I'll take a break to handle other other projects. But um, I guess it's in my blood. I, I'm always going, so. Yeah. Now, when you go out there, though, do you get a sense of excitement or fear or maybe both? depends on the situation if i'm going to a place where something has recently happened i'll be a lot more apprehensive than going to a, uh, a to a cold spot you know what i mean it's something that i i'm just i it, pick a spot in the map where i i know maybe things have happened in the past but uh-huh. nothing nothing reported recently so it's it's kind of a crapshoot going to a spot like that but uh on a hot location oh yeah it, it's a different uh different approach <laughs> yeah i mean i could ma- but you you would say that you never go out alone though right you always no, oh, go out. never i never go alone yeah and you always go out armed right yeah 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 um <laughs> but 
like that's what you feel now. But what was your take on that? Maybe 15 years ago, oh. would you? <laughs> Back then, now I, I never go alone anyway, just because there's all kinds of things that can happen. But oh, okay. uh, you know, we let's say 15 years ago, um, I we'd go out, you know, no kind of weapons, no nothing really. I mean, you know, we're we're cautious with in bear country and stuff like that, but. Um, yeah, it wasn't really that much of a thought about safety from these things. Of course, you know, you, you learn things over time. So, uh, and especially with the contacts that I've made in the past few years, a uh, whole revolution in thinking. So, yeah, you, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that just because I remember this is a, a long time ago, but I remember that uh, somebody that I knew just went out, uh, they were hunting but it was just two of them and they kind of got lost and the guy, he cut himself on a, uh, it, it wasn't like a, like an attack from an animal or anything like that, but the, he just cut himself on a tree and it was a pretty big gash and his friend had to stitch him up and they also got lost. And so your point about not going into the woods alone is true because they said that, Hey, <laughs> if he, if this guy was alone, he would have maybe bled to death, and they didn't know where they were. So it, you have to have always a person with you at all oh, times. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there's, uh, I've I've been out. I've I've only actually gotten lost one time, and that was because, well, I wasn't in the field. Uh, a friend of mine and I were um, looking for chanterelle mushrooms, and uh-huh. uh, if, the whole the whole day was my my wife wanted to make some spaghetti. And I, I told her, oh, I can get fresh mushrooms. <laughs> so we decided to go looking, and um, and you could sell them also. They they, they were a nice little source of extra money. So a buddy and I were up in the mountains, and, and I had my nose to the ground looking for these patches. And we'd actually gotten a couple of small ridges farther than I, I thought we did. And so when I decided oh i guess we better figure out where we are i was or was getting hungry or something and <laughs> and i said oops i don't know where we are and it was in a in a in a thick forest you couldn't there was no visibility anywhere except for the few trees ahead of you so um and it was funny my my friend he decided he just gave up he sat down and he was crying he was going to going to commit himself to to just knowing he was going to die and everything I looked at him. I said, "I'm hungry. I'm finding the car." <laughs> so <laughs> I, I found yeah. a little stream, and we followed the stream down and hit the road. And you know, we had to hike a couple extra miles to the car. But um, you know, there, I had food in the car, so I was getting I was getting uh, my stomach taken care of. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it's just a matter of paying attention and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Hey, now have you heard about? This has come up in the news recently. You know, I don't know uh, how true this is, but there are th- there are people out there saying that the Tasmanian tiger still exists, and there are people out there saying that they're going to discover it. Uh, have you heard about that? I mean, are, are there any comparisons between the Tasmanian tiger uh, and and this creature? Um, have you heard of that at all? Or? I, yeah, I've seen some things on it, and I suppose it's possible. Um, yeah. You know, because Australia is a big place, and um, you know, they don't don't go out searching a great deal of it. Yeah. But so, I mean, that's, that's something like that's possible. I mean, they do know that it, that it lived. It wasn't that long ago that it supposedly died out. Yeah. Um, the Sasquatch is something different, though. That's a, that's a different uh, whole different type of subject. Yeah, I mean, because everybody knew that the Tasmanian tiger existed at one point and then just went extinct. Mm-hmm. And now people are saying that, oh, well, now it exists again. But the Sasquatch was never officially recognized as existing. But I think in a lot of ways, it's more, way more prevalent than the Tasmanian tiger. Well, I think, what, I think what happened with the Sasquatch, and we've talked about this, um, is it's been such a long time period. Mm-hmm. between the time that our ancestors knew for a fact these things were real and had a lot of dealings with them uh, and not good dealings. And I think that they, at one point, believed that they were extinct. So as a, as a species, we collectively forgot about it. 
Yeah. And we talked about these little fairy tales from in Europe, Europe and places like that uh, that have this common theme. In fact, you can watch kids' movies, and there's the common theme exists in these kid movies today. Um, yeah. I, it, I think those are nothing more than echoes of those memories. Right, right. So we're we're looking at something now that's going to be the reaffirmation of discovery. It's not discovering these things. They were discovered. Humans knew about them um, yeah. intimately. And it's been such a, a gulf of time since they felt that they were gone, probably by their hands, um, and now that we don't have any memory of that anymore. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I could, I mean, you could equate that even to the, you know, the stone structures we find from civilizations around the world. You know that everybody in the world has a theory about, but nobody knows for sure what those <laughs> civilizations were like that made those things because it's been such such a gulf of time, right? And, and it's all been forgotten, right? Like, and also the pyramids, the Egypt, Egyptian pyramids. And the South American ones. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think yeah. those are I think those are good comparisons. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, how much time do we have? Are we... We get, we about, time to... we get about 10 minutes. Oh, okay, okay. So I was just going to ask, um, how has the internet changed things from for you in terms of your research? I mean, obviously networking is is good for you. I mean, hey, you and I wouldn't be talking to each other. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, it does. It does help in terms of connecting with people. Uh, and, and I get a lot of people sending me things, you know, good, solid information. Um, yeah. some bogus stuff, you know, that I, I mean, and it's easy, you know, I've sent you things that, that I, I felt was fake, uh, and the reasons why, but, um, you know, and com- being able to compare it to real stuff. So, uh, yeah. I mean, it's good to have that information. It's bad because, you know, there's, number one, there's all these um, impersonal people out there. You know, the ones that are can be shielded, you know, by using either fake names or no names and can say any stupid thing they want to, but, um, you know, without yeah. any repercussions. So you get that. Um, all There's a flood of information out there that we used to use to hold back and and to uh, gauge the authenticity of a story. So all that information's out there, which is, it's good and it's bad. Yeah. Um, there's, everybody's opinion under the sun is out there that colors a lot of the subject. You know, there's stuff that was proven to be wrong, and, and every periodically those things get put out there again. And, yeah. and, and a new generation of people gets kind of suckered into that stuff so i mean there's there's pluses and minuses i mean you just sort of have to keep your head down sometimes and and keep (laughs) keep forging ahead yeah you know one of my favorite scholars of all time who i used to talk about in my in my classes is uh neil postman who was a professor at uh, new york university and uh his famous book well he's got a few famous books one of them is called technopoly and his idea of tech- technopoly is that we deify our technology. And what he says is that, hey, technology is good. It brings us good things. Of course, we want to have it. But it also brings us bad things. And I think that's a perfect analogy to this subject. I mean, the Internet, it does give us great opportunities to network. But at the same time, technology, it also gives us the people that are fabricating information, like the uh, – People that we won't say here, but yeah, you know. there's great. There's great stuff on one side. There's junk on the yeah. other, and and it makes it so hard for people these days. And I kind of feel sorry for people these days because they're just bombarded with so <laughs> much stuff. Yeah. And and our brains will actually shut down when they yeah. when they're overstimulated. So um, yeah. some of the stuff I went through in my I majored in psychology. So. Um, it was interesting learning some of that stuff about how how our brains will shut off past a certain point of stimulation because it just is too much to process. Yeah. Um, and when it, my I grew up, of course, we didn't have all that, so it was uh, you know your outlets were in other other areas. Um, yeah. So I mean, but people are bombarded with so much stuff, and and. And and they're not willing to to read a great deal or really dig into stuff. It's kind of this surface stuff, um, you know, very uh, very shallow 
information and yeah. people will base their beliefs on very shallow things that are out there and, and that's kind of unfortunate but for those people who are willing to take the time and really dig into stuff uh in terms of this subject there's a wealth out there yeah yeah you just have to kind of understand what you're looking at yeah now on a personal level uh go back maybe five six seven mm-hmm. years ago or maybe 10 years ago uh and and look at now 2019 has the internet do you think has it kind of not, not to say that it ever was lacking but has maybe the internet reopened a, or sparked your enthusiasm in the subject again not to say again not to say that it was ever lacking but has it kind of given you new um kind of uh you know a shot in the arm this is what i love this is what i want to do type of thing i say it's better now than it was say 10 years ago um yeah it's a little easier to find things um, and of course there's more people putting stuff out there, uh, like, I know to give you an example, you know, a mic that we had on last week, uh, huh. I would have never known what he had. I mean, he might've said something and it was on Facebook, uh, but he put some of his pictures up there and I thought, oh, now those are interesting. So I was able to easily send him a message. He responded back and, and then of course we did the, uh, the show with him and, I, and I've been sending him, I sent him some photos, I'm sending him a book and want to keep in contact with him so uh, it's a great yeah. great way to make those kinds of connections yeah yeah and uh i mean your, your overall enthusiasm because i know there was a long time that we, we've talked about before but i mean it was a long time since you saw one of the creatures before and then i think you said that in the 1980s a little bit or uh for, for a while there, I'm not sure what time period, but for a while there, you kind of lost interest a little bit, and then you kind of gained interest a little bit, and now I think it's back into peak form, Yeah, I would say. there there were time periods when, um, because of the inf- information available, or making the contacts with people was very limited. So right. uh, when, we, when we had the PCSAT back in the 80s, um, Actually, before that, but I guess the the gap between the two incarnations, I, I had some periods. Of course, I was in the military and stuff, so you know my time yeah. was was very uh, um, limited. Very limited as far, yeah. as far as what I could do. My attention was very focused, but uh, um, there was there was a time when I sort of didn't think about it much. I mean. Every once in a while, you know, you get out in the forest someplace, you know, driving through an area, and it just kind of, out of the nowhere, sort of grabs me, you know. Yeah. But, um, yeah. um, yeah, like last year, we, we went to New Mexico uh, and uh, on, a, on a week's vacation, and uh, driving through northern Arizona <clears throat> that's fairly heavily timbered, uh, uh-huh. you know, I, I just, I wanted to stop the car and get out and, and trudge off through the forest looking <laughs> yeah but yeah these days i mean you know with with the faster connections and and meeting people online uh, yeah does it does give me an advantage in terms of field yeah. work and, and things like that yeah because now i mean definitely you have like well people like me but also everybody in the jrg that are supporting you now and uh and uh helping you and everything so i think that's a huge help yeah 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 so um hey just a couple more questions sure uh yeah here okay so here in florida we hear about the skunk ape a lot and i know that there are different types and everything of the of the creature and and, but the skunk ape or what they call a swamp ape in some places in the everglades they call it the swamp ape uh obviously it spends a great deal deal of time in the water Mm -hmm. um and maybe arguably it it maybe lives in the water for most of the time um in the pacific northwest out there in your northern california but also in washington have there been any reports in the pacific northwest of them living in lakes or swamps in the area well not living in them but around them oh really okay oh yeah that's well, interesting. see those kind of, those kind of places are a, a draw for all animals, so it's a great source of food. Okay, okay, I never heard that before, though. I thought that was just a, kind of a Florida thing. Oh no. Okay, okay. Um, also, okay, when you go out and research ex- and explore, uh, do you do you go mostly out with people that you know, 
or or and, and this doesn't have to be a, a current thing, but in the past, have you gone out with people that you knew, or did you ever get stuck <laughs> with anybody that or any weirdos that uh, that you had to go out with and explore with? They, you had no idea who they were, or or whatever. <laughs> well, it's almost always people that I, I'm you know good friends with, but um, it, I'll tell you, well, there was one incident where, um, and I think I think I, I think we've talked about this. Um, because I was thinking about mostly like if you ever had to go out with a TV show uh, crew or something like that. Well, I have, but um, those were different types of things. Like when I went down with uh, in Southern California and it was interviewed with Joe Rogan. But right. um, I, I had an incident back, geez, I can't remember. It must have been 89 or 90. Uh, it was, yeah, the early 90s where a friend you know, who was a, a two-time witness to these things, uh, knew a guy who who owned a, a chain of stores called Music Millennium at that time in Oregon. And his brother was an Oregon State Trooper, and they wanted to do make this documentary film. And supposedly the documentary film was going to be based on three subjects in this one location. <laughs> one, one centered around a, an old abandoned gold mine. One was Bigfoot. And I can't remember what the third one was, something about the river or, or whatever. But it was th- supposed to be three different areas. And I'd never met these two people. So we all agreed uh, that the friend of mine was uh, kind of the intermediate area. And so my friend Jack and I, we represented the PCSIT for the Bigfoot part. And supposedly he, and he brought this real expensive looking camera. Of course, the guy was wealthy. So um, we, we waited the river you know, mid chest deep to get into the area. We, we hiked up in there cross country and, and he was doing filming. And, uh, I can't remember the reason we came out, but we were going to go in again the next day and, and do a little more, uh, thorough search of the area, you know, for the gold mine and things like that. Well, we decided to go down on a, a, we didn't have any drinks. We were going to get a, you know, a little bit of beer and some soda and things like that. So we, drove eight miles to the nearest store and on our way back my friend met up with us and we thought oh what's what's he doing out here we figured these guys will all be back at the camp <laughs> relaxing and he says well these guys uh, you know they they lied then they were gonna they were gonna pay us each like a hundred thousand dollars and all this stuff made all these big uh gestures and it, it was it was a con job he told us he found out that they were just they wanted me to lead them up and and so he could film a big a bigfoot and then yeah. they were going to just cut us out of everything and <laughs> and he wanted to give us a heads up so it ended up those guys apparently figured out what was up with him leaving the camp and they took off uh which is a good thing because I would have taken them up there with that knowledge and I would have ducked out and lost them I would have left them up in the wilderness <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious I would have done it um <laughs> But you know, I guess you learn the hard way. You know, you, you people come to you and they tell you these things on the surface, yeah. and and then you find out they're scamming you. And of course, I've had that happen after yeah. that. But uh, um, you know, we won't yeah. go into that either. But it it, yeah. it does happen on occasion. Yeah, that's interesting. So I th- I think we're probably out of time right yeah, now, Brian, right? I think I think we're just about up on our time. So go ahead and give out your email address again and folks uh next week we have our our forensic anthropologist on and uh, a witness uh from northern bc the one i've talked about who um they actually they were so far away from human access to that area they they drove two hours to the helipad they flew another 60 kilometers to the work area and he had a really interesting encounter there and i'll have dan go through that a little bit some of the pictures will I'll post when I post it to YouTube I'll put some of the pictures on the uh, on the video but uh, that should be a very interesting show so anyway if you if you've got questions for an anthropologist send them to Brian and we'll be sure to ask him we'll bring those up next week so Brian yes. go ahead and give out your email yeah so the address is just Orlando outsider at yahoo.com um, Orlando outsider one word uh, at yahoo.com and uh, remember to s- subscribe on uh, YouTube absolutely and and be sure to stay tuned when Brian and I are finished uh, each week we're going to have a um, 
a narration uh, of an interesting story by Jim Sower. So when Brian and I are finished, be sure to stay tuned for that. Yeah. So Brian, awesome as always. Great chat. Oh. Yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll uh, definitely pick it up next week. Yeah, next week will be an interesting show. So folks, join us again next week. Okay. This story comes to us through the courtesy of Bigfoot researcher and author William Jevning. Narrated by Jim Sower. This story is from Rich Brumley, who was the director of the California Bigfoot Organization. 1980 through 1981, I was working as a security guard on a high-tension tower project here in California. I met a man who was a cat skinner operating a bulldozer, leveling off the pads where each of these high-tension towers was to be placed. I noted he had on his pickup truck 25 to 30 decals from places he had been hunting and introduced myself. During the conversation, I mentioned Bigfoot, and he told me that in the mid to late 1970s, he was doing a little poaching, with forestry officials' permission, in a locked and gated area near Bishop, California. They had given him a key so he could go in any time he wanted. This particular time, the gate was still locked, as it always was. He let himself in with his four-wheel drive pickup to the area known as Four Points. He drove over a hill, and there, to his surprise, were Department of the Interior Vehicles and Bureau of Land Management men, all in their Smokey the Bear outfits, with guns, searching a campground. The hills, mountains, roads, etc. They grabbed this hunter, took his deer rifle away from him, and questioned him for seven to eight hours as to what he was doing there. The local forestry officials identified him as a trusted friend and he was let go, but told to never come back. He had determined during his interrogation that the reason the BLM and Department of Interior were there in force was that a Bigfoot creature had gone through there the day before and had turned over a large trash container of the type you find behind large department stores, dumpsters, that no man can even begin to move and had killed several people. Over the years, the story was passed through several people, in fact, quite a few Bigfoot researchers, but no one was able to come up with one single clue. Then, in early to middle 1991, a young student also interested in investigating the Bigfoot mystery called the CFBO's hotline to tell me that he had heard that story several years ago and it had always stuck with him. He went on to relate that when he was doing some Bigfoot research in the town of Bishop, California, Inyo County, 1989-90, through 90, he met a former policeman who said he was on the Bishop Police Force in the mid to late 1970s. The student related the foregoing story of Bigfoot to the ex-police officer from Bishop, and he confirmed it. The officer said the story was the talk of the law enforcement agencies in that area at the time, but they were under very tight orders not to say anything about the incident and the related deaths. Richard Grumley lived from 1935 to 2000. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's william, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then...